Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Kristen Schilt. I'm the faculty director for the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I wanted to note another upcoming event we have next week. Um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat for this, but we're hosting a conversation um, with two sociologists, Yan, Yan Long at Berkeley and Yige Dong at SUNY Buffalo. Uh, it, the event is called Manning Up for the State, or for the Nation, excuse me, State, Media, and China's, China's Regulation Against Sissy Men. And this will be uh, run by graduate student Yu Chin Yang and assistant instructional professor Kate Fugazola from Global Studies. So this will be a great conversation and we hope you can join us for this event. So I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker who I've known since I think you were a second year grad student, Stefan, at Northwestern. So this is very yeah, exciting. So Stefan Vogler is a research scientist at the National Opinion Research Center here at the University of Chicago over across the Midway. And Stefan joined us uh, late last academic year in the middle of us being remote. So I think it's probably felt a little bit like you joined you know, an island with nobody there. So <laughs> I'm excited to, get to introduce you to the community and just really thrilled to have another sociologist who works in gender and sexuality um, on campus. So I'm hoping a lot of people will get to know you uh, from the law school and sociology and you know, welcome you to our community. Stefan got a PhD in sociology at Northwestern University and held the president's postdoctoral fellowship through the University of California system at Irvine prior to joining us here at NORC. And his work falls really between the intersections of socio-legal studies and gender and sexuality in the social sciences. And today, Stefan is going to be presenting on his recent book that just came out with the University of Chicago Press, Sorting Sexualities, Expertise, and the Politics of Legal Classification. So we're going to turn this over to Stefan, who's going to screen share and give us a talk, and then we'll open this up for Q&A. Um, and we do ask that when, if you have a question, which hopefully this will be a robust conversation, that you uh, unmute yourself and get on camera and ask your question. If you don't want to do that, I can definitely ask it for you. But I look forward to this. And Stefan, please take it away. Awesome. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much, Kristen, for inviting me today. Um, and thank you all for attending. I'm really excited to present. This is my first book talk since my, um, oh, come on, there we go. Since my new book, Sorting Sexualities, has come out. So what I'm going to present today is part of the larger book project, which is a comparative study of legal classification practices around sexuality. Uh, so I'll give a bit of an overview of the book argument, but today I'm really going to focus on what are chapters five and six of the book. So uh, signs of queerness and the detection of deviance in, in asylum seekers and sex offenders, respectively. Um, <clears throat> So we know that objectivity is a central tenet of the law, and yet we know from a range of studies uh, on topics from policing to prosecutorial discretion to sentencing and beyond, that objectivity is often an aspiration of the law rather than a reality. One way that courts have tried to strive for greater objectivity, particularly on questions that go beyond the law's usual expertise, is to draw on various forms of scientific and technical expertise. So this might take the form of epidemiologists and toxic tort claims, economists and wage discrimination claims, or the development of um, algorithms and actuarial risk assessments. Um, for various um, assessment or evaluations of, of, of offenders. But what happens when courts have to determine something as subjective and multivalent as what someone's sexuality is? Uh, so this is actually the precise question that I take up in this talk today. And to do this, I'm going to take us into the workings of two state legal institutions charged with discerning individual sexualities, the state immigration uh, and penal apparatuses, and specifically asylum determinations of sexual minorities and forensic evaluations of sex offenders. <clears throat> Courts have historically been very apprehensive about making explicit statements about what sexuality is or how it can be determined, even in cases actually dealing explicitly with those topics. 
But in asylum and sexually violent predator or SVP hearings, this is exactly what courts are charged with doing meaning that both offer ideal sites for analyzing the legal constitution of sexual identity categories and the social production of difference in those institutions. But as I'm going to show in this talk, courts really approach the measurement and classification of sexual subjects in very different ways in these two domains. They do so by drawing on competing notions of sexuality circulating in our culture, but more importantly, by drawing on diverging kinds of scientific expertise that support those respective views about sexuality. So in this way, scientific technical expertise is imported into the law in order to diffuse different types of legal legitimacy crises and to shore up law's power and authority. So ultimately, I'll argue that legal attempts to classify sexual others naturalizes these social differences along the lines of sexuality, and it simultaneously legitimates differential forms of governance and social control for sexual populations. So I contend in the book that this is possible because sexuality is constituted as a social, as a multivalent social technology that can be taken up for a variety of purposes, whether it's to sort people, order lives, extract labor, partition space, or create subject positions. But before I get further into this argument, I wanna take us briefly into two of my field sites. So first, during the, during the first asylum hearing that I observed, an interaction between the state's attorney and the petitioner struck me. Kofi, a gay man from Ghana, testified that he had tried to date a woman to conceal his true sexual identity, but that he had been dumped or that she had dumped him because he was quote, like a woman. The lawyer jumped at the chance to show that Kofi might not be gay, asking, well, did you have sex with her? We tried, Kofi responded. Well, did you have sex through to completion, the lawyer persisted. Kofi testified that he had not, and he eventually did receive asylum, thanks in part to the immigration judge's stated belief that one sex act does not reveal one's true sexual orientation, and that it was pretty understandable that Kofi would try to hide his sexuality in an environment where it might get him killed. In a very different, though, as I argue, related setting, I watched as a neuropsychologist clicked through PowerPoint slides containing fMRI images of brains of men with normal sexualities and those with deviant sexual interests, as he termed them. The men whose brains these belong, or the men who these brains belong to, rather, uh, had participated in an experiment where they were shown a series of computer-generated nude characters, both adults and children, to assess how the brains of pedophiles and normal men reacted in an effort to improve methods of identifying and assessing the risk of sex offenders. As he concluded his presentation, the, neuroscien or the neuropsychologist announced that his goal was to never have to, quote, talk to the guy at all, just plug his brain, as a brain and penis into a machine. So these contrasting approaches begin to show how these two legal arenas charged with adjudicating individual sexualities actually go about doing so. To receive asylum, LGBTQ petitioners must prove both that they're a sexual minority and that their status as such was the reason for their persecution. In US sex offender law, by contrast, many offenders undergo a series of psychosexual evaluations meant to prove their sexual preferences and predict their likelihood of committing future sexual violence, the outcome of which can determine a range of legal consequences, including whether they will be deemed a, a sexually violent predator or SVP uh, and indefinitely detained under civil commitment after serving their criminal sentence. In the book, I argue that in these two contexts, how we come to know sexuality undergirds myriad governance decisions regarding sexual populations, and moreover, that non-state expert actors are often central to these legal knowledge practices. I show how through efforts to render sexual subjects leg legible to and thus manageable by state institutions through measuring and classifying sexuality, uh, law and science work together to co-produce sexuality as a regulatory category but they do so in culturally contoured and organizationally specific ways that concretely affect legal outcomes and determine access to the rights of citizenship. In this talk, I'm specifically going to ask how non-legal forms of expertise affect what counts as evidence of sexuality in legal proceedings and what effects these epistemic processes have on legal conceptualizations of sexuality. 
I argue that these two areas of law differentially constitute sexuality as a result of the different forms of expertise and evidence on which each of these legal complexes draws in conjunction with the cultural frames, uh, political constraints and institutional imperatives that give these knowledges force, what I call epistemic logics in the book. I'm gonna show that sexual determinations in both areas of the law are the dual product of First, how someone talks about their sexuality. And second, how their body and bodily acts become performatively implicated as evidence in that narrative. But both types of evidence are filtered through logics that suggest either that the proffered evidence offers direct measures or indirect indicators of sexuality. So although both areas depend on both types of evidence to some extent, those in asylum adjudications tend to approach the measurement of sexuality through indicators or signs of a rather inaccessible subjective state, whereas experts and decision makers in sex offender evaluations tend to believe their data to be direct measures of sexuality. Now, certainly the context of these decisions is different, right? Asylum seekers are seeking entry to the country as potential citizens and must prove they are who they say they are. Sex offenders, by contrast, are most likely trying to prove that they are not what the state thinks they are and are fighting for the right to re-enter civil society after a criminal sentence, rather than being indefinitely detained as part of the state's civil commitment of sexually violent persons or predators. But both face adversarial legal context where their sexuality is the central question. And although today it's strongly held cultural common sense that homosexuality and sexual criminality are distinct and different phenomena, this is a very historically recent change. Until 2003, for example, when Lawrence v. Texas was decided by the Supreme Court, consensual same-sex sexual relations were still criminalized in 14 U.S. states, meaning that, in fact, gay people were sex criminals in those states. Until 1990, gay people were barred from entering the U.S. because they were deemed psychopathic personalities. And before 1973, homosexuality was considered a paraphilic disorder, categorized in the same section of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or the DSM, as pedophilia, voyeurism, and other criminal sexualities. Uh, in fact, even today, uh, sexuality researchers search for the clues to the etiology of homosexuality, pedophilia, and other non-normative sexualities in the same areas of the brain, the same genes, or they look for bodily clues in the same places. So both gay men and pedophiles, for instance, purportedly are more likely to be left-handed. Likewise, many lab scientists use the penile, penile plethysmograph, or PPG, in experiments with both pedophiles and gay men. And given, so given this continuing use of, of similar scientific methods for a range of sexualities, we might expect the law to also approach the measurement of div uh, diverse sexualities in similar ways. I chose this comparison then to illustrate the power of the law to constitute different sexual categories and to highlight the role of expertise in legitimating those processes. I show that despite this historical commonality, today divergent forms of expert knowledge have helped complete, uh, create completely different ways of conceptualizing and classifying sexuality in the domains of asylum and sex offender law. In other words, legal classification practices have helped cement and naturalize cultural knowledge about sexuality, including this historically recent distinction between homosexuality and sexual criminality. Clearly, of course, political, legal, and intellectual opportunity structures all differ considerably for each of these issues. Political, cultural, historical, and institutional variables are, are all major factors in establishing what type of expertise will predominate in a given, given legal complex. And taken together, they influence how sexuality is conceptualized uh, in asylum and SVP law. But once a given type of expertise is entrenched, it significantly influences how legal actors view sexuality in a given arena. And specifically, as I'll talk about today, what counts as empirical evidence of sexuality. So it mediates, in a sense, between larger, larger social forces and the ultimate legal understandings of sexuality. Um, I'm glad to talk more about these various variables in the discussion, but, um, uh, but I'll mostly uh, concentrate today uh, 
uh, on these legal understandings of sexuality. So in the rest of this talk, I'm first going to discuss my theoretical concerns before briefly talking about my data and methods. Uh, I'll then present my findings in two parts. First, uh, I'll consider what counts as empirical evidence of sexuality in LGBTQ asylum claims. And second, I consider the same issue for sex offender evaluations. So as I mentioned earlier, the classification is central to law and legal processes, whether it's determining if a group merits heightened scrutiny as a suspect class, deciding on risk classifications, or as California police have now begun doing, making snap determinations of people's race, gender, and sexual orientation in each encounter. Oops. Classification has likewise been essentially important, uh, essentially important for scholars of gender and sexuality. Uh, and debates about how to best measure that have occupied gender and sexuality scholars for decades now. Related lines of research have shown that cultural preoccupations shape scientific and medical knowledge about gender, sexuality, and the body in ways that often work to simply reinforce cultural common sense rather than conduct true inquiries into these phenomena. Uh, but little work examines how the law knows, so to speak, sexuality, or how it constitutes sexual identity categories, particularly as the basis for state governance. I think this is an important and overlooked issue because the law, which comes with the full force and backing of the state, arguably wields even more classificatory power than science. So by examining sexuality in these legal contexts, I'm first and foremost interested in how the law participates in the production of social difference. Sociolegal scholarship that has examined law's constitutive nature has noted the power of law to at least partially structure social life, including social identities. Law often mediates identities and interests in bureaucratically constrained ways that serve the institutional goals of the law. So one of the most significant bodies of work in this tradition has analyzed the ways by which the law constitutes racial categories, including shaping their content, what they mean, and what privileges accrue to them but there's been comparatively little work in this vein on sexuality. Related, relatedly, work on the legal constitution of race has also demonstrated that legal actors often draw, drew on outside forms of expertise, especially anthropology, to legitimate their decisions about race. Similarly, similarly uh, Joachim Savelsberg has suggested that the way that knowledge is differentially institutionalized in different countries affects how criminal punishment regimes develop. So I'm suggesting something similar here, but at a meso-organizational level, specifically that the type of expertise institutionalized within a legal domain will guide legal conceptualizations of sexuality and ultimately legal outcomes. In doing so, I'm trying to build on work by both science and technology studies scholars and socio-legal studies scholars exploring the role of science and expertise in the law. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna specifically, um, or I will specify rather, how legal and scientific actors cooperate to classify se sexual subjects for subsequent state action. And I think the best way to do this is really to look to the legal details. Uh, and in particular for this talk, to look at what counts as evidence of sexuality in each of these legal domains. Uh, but first, a brief detour to describe my methods. So my methodological approach involved the triangulation of data drawn from documentary and legal case analysis, interviews, and ethnographic observation. Uh, because both asylum law and sex offender law have federal and regional or state-specific components, I wanted to collect data that could speak to all of these different levels of analysis, from the federal policy down to individual courtroom interactions. So I began by constructing a database of 204 appellate decisions and state court decisions regarding sex offenders and 184 appellate court um, decisions regarding asylum. Now, I believe 184 was the entire universe of asylum decisions at the time of my search, but I sampled sex offender cases because there are so many more of them. There are thousands and thousands. I also collected and analyzed policy, NGO and government agency documents, laws and academic articles describing and, and assessing actuarial risk assessment and mental health diagnosis and sex offenders. 
To corroborate and enrich the findings for my documentary and case analysis, I conducted 41 semi-structured interviews with legal and scientific actors in both asylum and sex offender law, including administrators, treatment providers, lawyers, mental health professionals, activists, and expert witnesses. Finally, for 18 months, I observed the bi-monthly meetings of the Illinois Sex Offender Management Board, through which I was able to observe two SVP trials, where courts determine whether a sex offender will be indefinitely civilly committed. I attended and observed the annual meeting of the Association for the Treatment of Sex Abusers and the biannual meeting of the International Association for the Treatment of Sexual Offenders, as well as the regional conference hosted by Illinois' ATSA chapter. In addition to conducting some of my interviews at these meetings, I also engaged in, in numerous less formal conversations with mental health and legal professionals involved in sex offender management. Uh, and finally, I spent two years observing Advocates for Immigrant Rights, which is a pseudonym for an immigrant rights organization with a national presence on queer immigration issues that provides legal representation to queer asylum seekers. Uh, and through AIR, I was able to observe 12 asylum merits hearings. So, considering what constitutes evidence of sexuality for asylum seekers. So, evidence of sexuality for asylum seekers is really heavily focused on claimants' narratives. Indeed, the law actually allows for an asylum seeker's credible testimony to sustain their burden of proof without corroboration. But in practice, many adjudicators still want corroboration. And in practice, many things aside from a claimant's narrative, including stereotypes and bodily demeanor, might play an evidentiary role. Uh, however, narrative evidence does tend to carry the day in asylum proceedings, and attempts to rely on purported bodily indicators of sexuality have largely been rebuffed by courts. So for asylum seekers, the key aspect of a credibly constructed sexual uh, narrative revolves around identity and its development. The lawyers I observed typically guided their clients through a series of questions meant to elicit a coming out story of sorts. And interviewees consistently reiterated the importance of this narrative. Victoria Nielsen, the former legal director of immigration equality offered uh, an illustrative response saying, the most important thing is with any kind of asylum case, the person's own testimony. The more you can get the applicant to talk about their own internal coming out experience, how he or she first began to realize they were gay, what their first encou romantic encounter was, how that came about, how that made them feel. I think the more you can get someone to talk about those details, the more credible they sound. So consistent with this notion of narratives as elicited signs that must be placed in a particular context to make sense, Asylum claims always include information on conditions in the petitioner's native country. While some claims only use <clears throat> this information to corroborate assertions of persecution, many also provide cultural context for understanding sexuality cross-culturally. As one US immigration judge uh, told me in our interview, if a person identifies as queer or as bi or as this or as that, what does that actually mean? What do you have, what you have to always do is really look very carefully at the information that exists about the culture and the country and the politics of the place the person's going to. And sexuality has very different nuances in these different countries. Similarly, speaking about one of the early trainings he conducted with asylum officers, co-founder of immigration equality, equality Levy Soloway told me, I remember one officer putting up her hand and asking me, if a male officer raped an individual who is now an asylum applicant and the asylum applicant claims or asserts that that violent act against him was because he was gay, how do we understand that? Because wouldn't that sexual act by the police officer mean that police officer was gay? Now, unfortunately, sexual assaults like this are very common in queer asylum claims. But without understanding the cultural context in which the penetrating man may not be viewed as gay, an adjudicator could easily find no nexus between the claimant's persecution and their sexuality. Advocates, however, have really established an epistemic scaffolding in this area of law that implores adjudicators to account for cultural context and the cultural variab variability of sexuality. So as these statements suggest, narrative and its interpretation is paramount for discerning sexuality in asylum claims. Sexuality is not assumed to be directly measurable by or accessible to adjudicators, 
Rather, stories about a claimant's attractions, feelings, and subjective identities conceptualized, or sorry, contextualized within the petitioner's native culture act as indicators of an underlying sexuality. As these next examples will show, when judges have attempted to use bodily indicators, such as gender presentation or sex acts, as direct measures of sexuality, they've largely been rebuffed by appellate courts. So if interpreting narratives represents the indirect method of measuring sexuality, then appeals to the body represent the direct approach. For asylum seekers, this tends to come in the form of gendered stereotypes, as this wonderful uh, family, or not family guy, American dad meme shows us. Uh, so the effeminate gay man or the butch lesbian, or sometimes it might come in the form of sex acts themselves. But as one former immigration judge told me, it's consistency of behavior with a story, meaning that if the body comes into play in asylum claims, it must fit within the overall narrative presented, and appellate courts now routinely strike down decisions that do use stereotypes. In the particularly illustrative and highly cited, state, cited Ross Kane v. Holder, the Tenth Circuit uh, vacated a judge's asylum denial based on inappropriate use of stereotypes to discredit the claimant. The unanimously worded uh, decision included a strongly worded admonishment of such arbitrariness in the law, saying, to condone this style of judging unhinged from the prerequisite of substantial evidence would inevitably lead to unpredictable, inconsistent, and unreviewable results. The fair adjudication of a claim for restriction on removal is dependent on a system grounded in the requirement of substantial evidence and free from the vagaries flowing from notions of the assigned immigration judge. Such stereotyping would not be tolerated in other contexts such as race or religion. So statements like this work to debunk gender-based stereotypes and have moved evidentiary standards in asylum proceedings away from a focus on the body as a source of knowledge about sexual orientation. As I mentioned, the body often also comes into play for asylum seekers when actual sex acts are considered, as in the opening anecdote with Kofi. But again, this is really a narration of the body in sex acts that's considered by courts, and it's therefore less a form of direct knowledge than another type of indirect evidence consistent with the identity narrative described earlier. So like stereotypes, sex acts are more likely to be deemed relevant when they're part of a larger narrative of discovering and expressing one's sexual identity. So these findings ultimately suggest that the body carries relatively little importance as direct evidence of sexuality in asylum claims. Stereotypes and common sense are, cannot serve as the basis for a judge's decision. And though sex acts may be taken to signal queer identities at times, it's also clear that sex acts are not required to make a valid asylum claim and may not be enough to sustain a claim on their own. Uh, in fact, US Citizenship and Immigration Services guidance to adjudicators instructs them to avoid overly intrusive questions about sex acts in favor of questions about one's felt identity. Uh, moreover, when sex acts do become part of a claim, they're not necessarily taken again as direct evidence of one's underlying sexuality. Rather, like issues of gender nonconformity, sex acts become contextualized within larger narratives and thus become further signs to be interpreted. So this is really consistent with the overall finding that narrative evidence is the most determinative for classification and asylum claims. Now, just as with asylum seekers, narrative and bodily evidence come together to legally classify sex offenders' sexualities as well. But unlike the indirect approach found in asylum law that heavily weighs a claimant's identity narrative as a sign of an unobservable intersexual self, uh, much of the evidence in the evaluation of sex offenders assumes that sexuality can be directly measured. So an erect penis during a penile plethysmograph or PPG examination is sexual orientation. I'll come back to this momentarily. Sexuality itself is materialized through the technology of the PPG. Overall, there's a greater effort in sex offender evaluations to distill or transform signs of one's sexuality into direct measures of that person's sexuality. The process of interpreting indicators is not seen so much as interpretation as much as direct reading. The aptly named master file is perhaps the perfect illustration of what sociologist Dorothy Smith calls textually mediated forms of ruling. <laughs> 
It consists of a set of texts that allow details of an offender's biography to be crystallized, removed from their local context, and transported across time and distance. So the offender's criminal, disciplinary, and medical records, and importantly, mental health and sex offender-specific treatment records are all part of this file. And this file is really the most important piece of any evaluation because it forms the basis for the actuarial risk assessment and often the psychiatric diagnosis as well. It's not unusual for an, an evaluator to complete a risk assessment and give a sex offender a psychiatric diagnosis without ever talking to him. The sexual narrative also consists of a sexual history interview. Uh, and these interviews delve into sex offenders' intimate thoughts and behaviors, including the types of sexual fantasies they have and what they think about when masturbating. And they often employ the polygraph, which seeks to objectively measure via the body one subjective testimony. Thus, even though sexual histories might concentrate on behaviors and desires, the polygraph engenders and even forces the performative enactment of a deviant identity for the sex offender. Now, I'm happy to talk more about the various aspects of the sexual narrative in the discussion, but I want to focus on one particular aspect here, which is the actuarial risk assessment. Uh, and apologies, that might be pretty small on your screen, um, but I'll try to walk through it. So actuarial risk assessments uh, provide a clear picture of how an offender's entire biography can be distilled down in just a few, into just a few sets of numbers. The idea behind actuarial risk assessment is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, researchers aggregate data on large numbers of offenders and they follow them for a specified period to ascertain their recidivism rates. They then retrospectively compare those who reoffended re with those who did not to determine factors that seem to affect recidivism. And then those factors become the basis for assessment. Offenders to be assessed are then compared to the sample group on the selected factors to predict one's likelihood of uh, recidivism. Uh, so the static 99R, which is the coding form you see here up on your screen, is the most widely used actuarial risk assessment for sex offenders in the United States. And it's a 10 item assessment that requires information about the offender's demographics, their criminal history and victim information. An evaluator simply plugs in the answers to these questions that you see listed on this uh, page, and a, risk and a risk score ranging from negative three to 12 is produced, along with a corresponding group recidivism rate. Now to obtain the recidivism prediction, again, I apologize for this being a bit small on here, uh, an evaluator must choose the correct reference group for the offender, of which there are four for the static 99R, uh, for instance, the predicted sexual recidivism rate for an offender who scored a six and was placed in the high risk, high need category, as most offenders being considered for SVP status are, um, would be 31.2% over five years and 41.9% over 10 years. So you can see those are the, the boxed in numbers there. Through this process, an offender's biography is distilled into a set of numbers. And this really represents the process of creating ordered psycholegal knowledge from a vast set of observations that may have several possible interpretations. Uh, in essence, the static 99R acts as an inscription device. And as Latour and Woolgar point out, inscriptions are regarded as having a direct relationship to the original substance. In this case, the risk score, label, and predictive res predicted recidivism rate are all taken to be directly related to the offender and particularly to his sexuality and sexual risk. So the PPG uh, introduced above is a widely used technology for determining a sex offender's sexual preferences. Uh, and it's essentially a blood pressure cuff that's placed around a man's penis, uh, which you can see here in the, in the picture. Uh, the man is then shown pornography or listens to audio vignettes of sexual situ situations, and his penile response is measured. So like the polygraph, which aspires to ascertain the truth of an offender's sexual narrative via the body, the PPG seeks to know a subject's sexual desires via bodily measures. The PPG assumes, for instance, that a flaccid penis cannot be indicative of any arousal state, the male arousal is completely centered on the erect penis, and the male sexuality is unemotionally task-driven. Um, 
So in the commitment hearing of Jacob Sandry in Illinois, for instance, the court sought to determine whether the PPG was admissible as part of an expert's testimony. Uh, it's, its reasoning is unusually blunt, uh, but it illustrates well the tacit assumptions adopted by, by most courts when considering PPG evidence. So the court wrote, the contours of our inquiry are limited to whether there is some reasonable connection between the methodology and what it seeks to measure. The reasonableness inquiry is fairly straightforward in this case. Quite simply, penile engorgement is a plausible measure of sexual arousal. This observation ends the reasonableness portion of the inquiry. Simple enough. So with that decision, the court upheld the validity of the PPG as a measure of sexuality and the authority of forensic psychology to assess that validity. But perhaps more importantly, with its appeal to common sense, the court also upheld its own authority to dictate what counts as authoritative knowledge. Occasionally courts do question the PPG and some of my interviewees do acknowledge the shortcomings of it despite using it in their own assessments. In discussing the PPG, uh, Sean Jumper, the clinical director of Illinois' SVP program said, well, it's not a perfect test. Probably the most common thing that we see is we get as far as we can tell a valid test that the guy shows no arousal at all. So he's not showing any arousal to healthy or deviant stimuli. And it's unlikely that that would be the case. And if it were true in the case, the person would be asexual, which isn't very likely. So a lot of times it doesn't capture somebody's arousal. But notice here that, that Jumper maintains faith in the test's ability to measure arousal when it is present. He places blame on the test itself rather than the assumptions underlying sexuality uh, or the assumptions about sexuality underlying the test. So if a test does not show amounts of arousal, it's not because the PPG is measuring something that does not accurately capture arousal, but because that particular testing situation was an anomaly. So these data show that the body is much more central to the classification practices of SVP proceedings than of asylum proceedings. The body is viewed as a direct indication of one's uh, sexuality, and even more subjective pieces of evidence are translated into more objective and direct evidence by actuarial risk assessments, psychiatric diagnoses, and the master file. So I've shown here that the evidentiary practices institutionalized in the arenas of SVP and LGBTQ asylum law dictate dramatically different measure, methods of measuring sexuality and classifying sexual subjects. Though officials in both or areas are tasked with rendering an individual's sexualities uh, legible for state action, they do so in starkly divergent ways, in significant part uh, to the types of non, due to the, non, the types of non-state expertise that the law calls upon to aid with these classification efforts. These findings point to the central importance of non-state expert actors in the day-to-day -day work of the legal bureaucratic classification practices and, and suggest that experts are key social actors for legitimating legal action and new forms of social control. By approaching the classification of sexual subjects in different ways, state institutions in conjunction with non-state expert actors also powerfully contribute to the materialization of sexual or social differences along the lines of sexuality. Specifically, I've shown that the classification of asylum seekers depends on an indirect approach to determining one's sexuality. Converse uh, and conversely, decision makers and sex offender evaluations more often employ inscription devices meant to objectively materialize sexuality or directly represent characteristics of the individual to categorize offenders as sexually dangerous. Ultimately, both classification processes constitute distinct sexual subjects and reify the historically recent cultural distinction between homosexuality and sexual criminality. And I think this is also evidenced by the knowledges and technologies through which sexual subjects are classified. Asylum seekers exercise substantial autonomy or agency in constructing their sexual narratives. Uh, these technologies of the self allow asylum seekers to create their own understandings of themselves and present that narrative as the primary evidence of their sexual um, essence. In short, they're sexual subjects. Sex offenders, by contrast, possess considerably less agency in the construction of their sexual selves before the state. 
Rather, technologies performatively, performatively construct these sexual subjects and mental health expertise or experts mediate between the state and the offender. So in other words, sex offenders are in many ways denied subjecthood. Rather, their bodies become objects to be read. And these different knowledge practices have concrete effects. On the one hand, the epistemological stance adopted by forensic psychology suggests that sexuality is inherent to the individual and allows for easier assignation of criminal blame and sexual risk. Uh, on the other hand, more constructionist understandings of sexuality espoused by sociology and anthropology allow for greater consideration of social forces shaping sexuality and consequently easier recognition of sexualities unfamiliar to American adjudicators. The comparative framework of the study therefore throws into sharp relief the ways by which divergent legal classification practices differentially naturalize sexual kinds, institutionalize cultural common sense about social difference, and in turn legitimate governance decisions concerning sexual groups. Now, again, although homosexuality and sexual criminality have historically been tightly coupled in both law and science, that state institutions have developed uh, or decoupled the two and approached their measurement and classification in different ways suggests that legal classification practices reflect and also reify shifting cultural boundaries regarding sexuality. In other words, the legal system both reflects the dynamics of sexual stratification within our culture uh, and influences them through its own internal developments. These distinctions are, of course, also central to determinations of subjects' moral deservingness and whether they will be afforded the legal rights of citizenship. In these arenas and beyond, sexuality has become an important way to sort subjects and determine their eligibility for benefits uh, or protections. I've also tried to illustrate the law's constitutive power in regard to sexuality. So the sexually violent predator, for instance, is a legal creation, and the law has defined its parameters, content, and the rights, or lack of rights, that accrue to it. And we can see how the term sexual predator has gained wider cultural resonance since its uh, advent in the late 1980s and 1990s in this uh, Google Ingram. The story is similar with the term sexually violent. Uh, which uh, with its inflection point in the mid 1990s when a slew of laws aimed at those who were sexually violent were considered and, and passed in many states. So I further attempted to demonstrate that because legal actors are charged with ascertaining individual sexualities, but sexuality is not defined, uh, courts draw on pre-existing institutional practices and cultural schemas to create divergent ways of knowing sexuality in each of these legal realms. Legal knowledge is thus already socially and culturally structured before final decisions are ever rendered. Sexuality scholars have shown how cultural assumptions about sexuality influence scientific examinations of sexuality, producing knowledge about it that's already contoured by social forces, Similarly, I've shown that social forces shape how sexuality is constituted in legal institutions by creating conditions under which divergent knowledge practices can become institutionalized. I think these same insights could likewise be applied to a range of other state classification efforts, whether around race and ethnicity, sex and gender, or citizenship status, all issues that have come to the political forefront recently. And with that, I'm just going to wrap it up and and start taking some questions, having a discussion with everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was really fantastic. Um, what we're going to do now, if you want to put your name in chat, I can call on you. If you don't want to ask your question, since this is being recorded, I can read your question. But as everyone is kind of formulating, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question first. <laughs> um, so Stefan, you know, I remember seeing you present on this at a conference I think we were both at at Northwestern. And I'm yeah. so curious about PPG um, and where else is this used? Like, I mean, I remember it being most sort of notably in the classic study from that person at Northwestern whose name I can't, Michael Bailey, saying Michael that Bailey. Thing is a bisexual man and that he had used yep. PPG to prove that like all women are bisexual and no man is bisexual either gay or straight. So I'm curious, like what is the kind of scientific view on 
PPG is evidence, right? Like, is this considered like widely valid science, like outside of this case? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the short answer is yes, it is. It's, and so um, Tom Wade Zunas, um, another sociologist of sexuality, has, wrote a book called The Straight Line. And in that book, he traces the way the sort of science of sexuality and what counts as, as evidence of, of sexuality in, in largely in psychology, right? And, and he really shows that these physiological measures like the PPG are what he calls the gold standard. And, and they really are, right? So this is especially true in the domain of psychology, right? The, the penile plethysmograph or PPG um, has really become the gold standard for determining someone's sexuality. So, um, and part of the reason for this is Tom, Tom Wade Zunas really deftly shows is because of these debates around um, 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 conversion therapy, right? Um, so in, in, in studies about, um, about conversion therapy, they're, they're based on self-report, right? So, oh yes, I used to be gay, I'm no longer gay. Um, I'm reporting this subjectively, right? And people were really skeptical of that, rightfully so. Um, and, and so this, this sort of skirmish there ended up saying, okay, well, let's actually elevate physiological measures to the, the sort of you know, gold standard for determining someone's sexuality because these subjective measures really aren't reliable. Um, and so he does a really lovely job of showing how this, this sort of fight between the ex-gay movement, so to speak, and, 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 and psychology sort of um, ended up elevating this type of evidence to an even more prominent status. And so, um, so yeah, to, to answer your question, it's very widely used in psychology. It's accepted as a, as a valid kind of evidence. Um, even beyond the use of sex offenders. It's used, like you said, with Michael Bailey's study to look at, at bisexual men, to look at gay men. Um, yeah. Great. It's also used in medical studies around like impotence and stuff like that. Great. So. Yeah. Um, Marianne Case, would you like to ask your question? I would, thanks. And I'm gonna try starting my video and hope it doesn't crash my uh, Wi-Fi. Hi. Um, Hi. My question was about um, a specific item on the chart with the um, score for sex offenders uh, uh -huh. for recidivism. Um, it went by me quickly. So I, I, is this still in use or is it an older chart? Because what leapt out at me is that you got an additional point if you had male victims, which yes. for pre-Lawrence strikes me as um, understandable, explicable, probably also legal, but right now strikes me as impermissible sex discrimination. Yeah, I'm glad you caught that. It is still in use. Um, this, this is the most widely used uh, risk assessment instrument in the, in the United States. In fact, probably in the country, though I, I'm not 100% sure, or not, sorry, not in the country, in the world, uh, in the Western world anyway. Um, and yes, it in fact does does increase your risk if you have a male victim. Um, and there's no sort of theoretical rationale behind that. I actually asked my interviewees when I when I talked to these forensic evaluators, and in fact, I talked to one of the co-creators of the Static 99R, and I said, you know, why is this here? Why, you know, what is this doing here in this day and age? And he's like, well, we found it in the meta-analyses. And so it's there, right? Like people with male victims tend to recidivate at higher rates. And so, um, so they found it in the data, they put it on there. It, and there is some evidence. So I, I did a, a report with the Williams Institute recently. And we did find, in fact, that there is some evidence that um, men who have sex with men, queer men, are, are overrepresented in the in, in SVP uh, civil commitment facilities. And so part of the reason for that, we think, is because of this question, uh, because of this, you know, have you ever had a male victim question? There's also one that asks if you've ever lived with a lover. <laughs> Interesting so choice of word. If you've ever lived with a lover for at least two years. Um, 
which again could could be uh, something, especially for older gay men, that um, you know that also increases their score. And so, yes, you're you're exactly right to be skeptical of that measure, but it it is still used, and there's definitely people that are saying, yeah, let's reconsider this, but it's it's still in very widespread use. Great. Uh, Grant Chin. Hello, I'm a student at the University of Chicago, um, and thank you for the talk, of course. Um, it seems difficult enough for um, formal legal systems, as you've illustrated, to adjudicate sexuality, particularly in a narrativistic and holistic manner that does justice to these unfamiliar sexualities, or endow them with like cultural and environmental nuance, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, Scrutiny on individual sexualities in broader societies is increasing year by year, particularly as gender or sexuality and these topics become common and approachable and increasingly controversial. So in situations where individuals rarely get to communicate such nuance and narrative, what would you then suggest as a means for individuals to kind of communicate in a rigorous manner, of course, rather than express their sexuality? The common response, I think, seems to be that um, barring the difficult circumstances that you've engaged with in your study, um, we should kind of de decentralize sexuality at large, right, in terms of these judgments and, and these rulings. But do you believe there to be a more reasonable reconciliation between the models that you've expressed and what you've seen? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I think that what we see in asylum law is not uniformly, uniformly horrible. I think that there are definitely issues with it, right? You know, the, the use of these sort of gendered stereotypes still sometimes sneak their way in to some of these assessments as do, you know, questions about sex acts like I showed in that opening anecdote to my talk. Um, but I think that, you know, if we're going to have these legal decisions that, de that depend on, you know, proving someone's sexuality, um, and, you know, the question of whether or not can, you know, what is sexuality to be proven in any of these contexts, um, you know, we, we need to do a good job of, of contextualizing that and understanding what sexual development looks like and what sexual identity development looks like, right? So, like, one of the issues in asylum, for instance, is that, um, you know, they often need to follow this sort of Western coming out narrative, right? Like, oh, I realized at an early age that I was gay. And then I like came out to myself and then I like came out to my best friend and like I had my first sexual encounter and da, da, da. That's not a typical, you know, coming out trajectory for a lot of people who are fleeing countries where they had to be closeted or else they might get killed, right? So, you know, so how do you assess someone's sexuality who can't, uh, you know, give that sort of, you know, um, typical Western coming out narrative. And so I think that's where, you know, actually having anthropologists or sociologists um, come in to testify about what it means to be queer in these different contexts and why they might not be able to talk about it in the same way is really important. Um, you know, it's harder in the in the case of sex offenders, right? I think we can all, you know, agree that like, you know, no one, it's, it's not a particularly sympathetic group. But when we start using these dubious technologies on sex offenders, I think it becomes a slippery slope, right? Where is, you know, where are these types of sort of anti-law going to end, right? So we use these, these really dubious, like sexual technologies to make a decision about locking people up for the rest of their lives, right? So uh, I personally think like civil commitment laws are unconstitutional and need to be gotten rid of. I don't think there's a legal context in which we can, you know, use a polygraph or a PPG as as strong enough evidence to lock someone up for the rest of their lives. But I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, uh, Allison Reed. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the talk. Um, thank you for modeling, um, you know, me your method and your particular um, mode of working with cases. And, and my question is actually around that kind of nuts and bolts um, kind of design question because you 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 have these interesting and it, obviously you make clear the connections between the cases. But when you think of um, asylum seekers, sex offenders, 
Um, part of what's really interesting about the study is that one might not necessarily put those two together um, yeah. prior to engaging with your work. And so just given that you're working with these distinct cases, I, I'm kind of wondering what your, your method and your system of comparison was like. I know you talked about your different data sources, um, but as you were approaching the work, did you come to it kind of with pre-existing categories? Like, okay, I know I'm gonna study um, narratives in the court, how things show up, you know, just, just kind of what was, what was your framing? But did you have like some provisional codes and dimensions that you know you wanted to compare going in? Were there any that, that were emergent as you did the work kind of areas that you didn't expect to compare across these disparate cases? So yeah, just some insight into how to like manage um, such kind of complex comparative work uh, would be much appreciated. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I will say this was not an easy comparison to do <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Uh, I, I think um, I'm probably before an audience right now who understands these historical, you know, commonalities and why it might make sense to like look at, at how these, you know, categories converge and diverge over time. But, um, you know, for a lot of audiences, it takes a lot of convincing to say like, hey, there's a reason to compare these. Um, to answer your question about how I sort of, you know, approached this and approached this comparison, um, I started with my work on 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 the queer asylum side, and I was and the and the driving question I really had there was, you know, if people have to prove their sexualities to a court, how are they doing it? You know, what's going on here? What do people take as proof of sexuality? So, in a way, this talk that I gave today was really the first question I asked. Um, and, and so I actually studied asylum for a couple of years before I ever started studying the sex offender side of things. Uh, and so I did go into that with some more, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, pre, um, pre-generated codes or expectations in a way. So, uh, I went looking for another case that would provide a contrast to the one that I already had, right? So we have to, you know, hold some things constant, but enough things have to vary that we can find some meaningful difference, right? When we're looking at comparative cases. And so I really went looking for like, where's another place in the law where sexuality is this sort of central question and someone is trying to prove it, or, you know, there, there has to be, you know, someone is proving someone else's sexuality. And so I went through a lot of different things like, you know, would I look at marriage? Would I look at don't ask, don't tell cases? Would I look at like adoption arguments? And sort of went through all of those and really, and, and I ended up finding these sex offender civil commitment hearings. And I was just sort of fascinated by these technologies that were, they were using. And I had no idea what I was going to find actually when I, when I started going into those. So um, don't be afraid to take chances, right? That's you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, but that's how we learn, that's how we do research, right? So, so that was sort of my approach to that comparison and how I, how I, um, how I approached it initially. Thank you. Great. Do we have any last questions? You can raise your hand and I can call on you. I'm willing to stick around for a minute or two if someone, if we do have more questions. I mean, I would put a plug in for also reaching out to Stefan. I feel like there's a lot of sociologists on here, which is so great to see. And, you know, I think it's so great to talk to someone who was trained in a different PhD program. Like, I'm so glad you were here, Marianne. Like, I hope you and Stefan can connect around law. We have such a great law school here, you know, but mm -hmm. um, it'd be really great to reach out to Stefan if you want to talk, you know, I think even about methods, about cases, about gender and sexuality. Yeah. Like, I think that would be great. Yeah, I, I love talking with students. I love talking with grad students and happy to talk about, you know, coming up with dissertation ideas and methods and all that good stuff. Yeah, and a normal time, we would be all having a reception right now. And so, you know, I, I realize we're missing out on that. So I hope soon we will. And we'll also feature Stefan at our next faculty book party. So you'll have a chance to talk there as well. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that'd be great. So fun. It was so fantastic to have you. And I really you know, am so thrilled that you were part of our series. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I was so glad to be able to, to talk with you today. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.